I'm sorry. The subcommittee will come to order. The chair recognizes himself for an opening statement. Good afternoon to everyone here and welcome to today's fiscal year 2025 budget hearing for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I want to thank all five of the commissioners for appearing before us today to discuss the important mission of ensuring people across the nation are protected against risks of injuries and deaths associated with consumer products. In particular, I want to thank the chair of the commission, Alex Hone Sarek, uh, for his work in promoting safety and protection in a fair and reasonable manner. I know you're particularly familiar with the subcommittee as well with your background as chief counsel. Uh, so we appreciate you, you being here. Um, and I want to thank you also for meeting uh, me in, uh, in my congressional district a few months back as well, and sending your staff to our senior fair. Um, now, I guess probably that wasn't your staff, but it was committee staff. I also thank the employees at the commission who work closely with Customs and Border Protection at ports across the country, inspecting millions of consumer products for hazardous, unsafe, or counterfeit goods. This work is important in ensuring public safety and in recent years with bad actors in China continuing to flood our nation's borders has become extraordinarily difficult. These consumer safety issues have consistently been a bipartisan effort for the Congress since the enactment of the Consumer Product Safety Act in 1972. And the statute uh, has long been explicitly clear in the way that it requires the commission to operate and work side by side with industry stakeholders. The existing laws model has proven very successful in protecting the public against harms while still allowing new innovations to thrive in the marketplace. The law mandates the commission to defer to voluntary product safety standards when applicable and has a clear due process requirement for ensuring corrective actions are taken when problems arise. Many of these voluntary standards are created and revised on a regular basis in close uh, conjunction with the American Society for Testing and uh, Materials International. And I appreciate the tireless efforts that many in the industry do to ensure their products work effectively and safely for millions of consumers every day. However, I know not everyone shares the same view that this model works the way it was designed to. And I have significant concerns about the government knows best mentality that is rampant across the Biden-Harris administration. When we started this Congress last year, we read reports that Commission, Commissioner Trumka had discussed the idea of a universal ban on gas stoves in this country. The American people have made it clear, clear to us. They made it clear absolutely clear. This type of government overreach is unacceptable. We know those in the uh, rush to green movement would like to ban all gas-powered appliances in our homes. I'm grateful that our committee acted quickly to denounce these ideas and move forward with Representative Armstrong's bill, the Gas Stove Protection and Freedom Act and Representative Lesko's companion bill on the Energy Subcommittee to prohibit this type of regulatory approach. I'm worried that these types of regulate first mandates will kill the ingenuity of the American spirit and the strongest marketplace in the globe. Unfortunately, that's what the Biden-Harris administration has become known for. I hope that the CPSC will not fall into this thinking any longer and instead work with Congress on ways we can ensure the American people stay safe through consensus measures. In fact, this committee has proven on a regular basis this year that it can deliver bipartisan wins in protecting consumers, including House passage of the Setting Consumer Standards for Lithium Eon Batteries Act, Representative Trahan's 
Youth Poisoning Protection Act and Representative Balderson's Awning Safety Act. In each of these bills, we've come to agreement to put appropriate guardrails in place to protect lives and prevent unreasonable risk of death and injury from the everyday products American consumers use. In closing, I appreciate the important work of the Commission, but similarly to my comments at our FTC hearing earlier this month, I implore the Chair to ensure that you do not erode the public's trust and instead work with us to protect consumers. I look forward to conducting this important oversight, oversight and to hearing uh, each of the Commissioner's testimonies, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Now I'll recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for her five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's so great to see all the commissioners um, here today. Um, I am such a supporter of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, really, that's my background for many, many, many decades that I've been interested in working on consumer protection. So I thank uh, all of you, and I want to say a special uh, thank you to our chair, Alex uh, Hone uh, Sarak. And as you heard, he um, had a special role to play, uh, especially in the, in the last Congress um, when he was our um, chief counsel and also worked on the, this very subcommittee um, that at that time was called the Consumer Protection Subcommittee. So I'm very happy to, uh, to, to see all of you um, and um, to talk about what a small and mighty committee this, this really is. The, the work that you do is so very, very important. Um, I want to say that the com commission now has um, worked to uh, get a, several rules um, in, in place that are definitely going to um, help um, uh, consumers um, on a number of things. Um, the uh, um, um, children um, in what is that? Batteries. Oh, in the batteries, um, and that rule is um, ever so important to protect them from dangerous uh, from dangerous batteries. Um, uh, children are in in danger of what's in here. The, crib, the, the bumpers that we um, have gotten, that you have gotten done in, in rules, and the uh, rule on, yeah. I just spoke legislation we passed earlier this year. Yeah, so the thing that's so great about the, the rules is that our subcommittee actually passed the legislation that led to the uh, led to the rulemaking that has become the law of the the land. So we're very proud of our legislative legislative work. I also want to mention, though, that I have um, two issues that I think could actually make the Consumer Product Safety um, Commission even even stronger. Um, that um, one one is um, that we should passed legislation um, that, that I call the sunshine in um, uh, product, safety. product safety, and that is one that would strike Section 6B. Please consider that. It used to be um, that it, it, we should not be saying that manufacturers should have the final word on whether or not consumers are going to be informed about, prod, uh, about product flaws and should be able, as the Consumer Product Safety Commission, to decide when consumers need to be uh, you know, told uh, about dangers that are lurking out there. Um, the other would actually raise the fee um, that um, is now limited um, for 
people who have broken the law. And it uh, is um, something that I think that we ought to increase. Uh, right now, the maximum penalty is 17,500. I'm sorry. 17.5 million. Oh, so, I'm sorry. 17.5 million dollars for companies where deaths have occurred. Why should we put a limit on that? And I think that we want to just eliminate the top, the top amount. Um, and, and so I am very, very, did I run out of time? No. Um, anxious that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we do that. Um, and with that, at this point, I'm going to yield back. Oh, no, if I have one second. We should not be cutting the budget of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. It is so small and I believe currently underfunded, and I know that my Republican colleagues are talking about a further cut, and I want to adamantly put on the table right now that we should not have any further cuts. We'll talk more about that later. Chair, uh, the ranking member uh, yields back. Now I'll recognize the chair of the full committee, uh, my friend, Mrs. Rogers, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Chairman Bill Arrakis, the last time the CPSC appeared before this committee was in 2019, so this hearing is long overdue. I want to welcome back Chairman Hohen Sarek, who is an alum of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the best committee on Capitol Hill. And I also want to welcome back Commissioner Feldman, who is the only member to testif testify last time the commissioners were in front of this committee. And I want to thank all of you for um, being here today and with the dedicated career staff and hard work to carry out the agency's mission. The Energy and Commerce Committee has been leading the way this Congress to advance solutions to protect the American people. One of our top priorities for this Congress has been addressing the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. We've advanced policies that protect the American people from questionable products coming from China, ranging from defective and unsafe products to those developed using forced labor, or as a result of disturbing human rights abuses. Now that CPSC is at full capacity with all of its commissioners, it's critical that the agency works to implement the important bipartisan legislation we've moved through this committee, especially efforts like the Safe Sleep for Babies Act, Sturdy Act, and Reese's Law, which have had strong backing of, of uh, ranking member Sierkowski uh, and Chairman Bill Rackus, as well as others on this committee um, who have a long record on these issues. We've also advanced bipartisan legislation to protect Americans from hazardous pr products ranging from home awnings to faulty lithium ion batteries to dangerous chemicals available online. I look forward to working together to get those pieces of legislation signed into law as soon as possible and to continue our work with bipartisan support to protect the American people. The CPSC has also been hard at work. I was pleased to see the agency prioritize the hiring of a chief technology officer and a chief data officer to modernize the agency's capabilities. I hope this leads to better efficiency and protection of the agency's data than what we've seen in the past. These roles should help the agency use their resources effectively and oversee the increased use of AI and machine learning to efficiently and accurately target hazardous products entering the country. I'm also glad that the children's product de uh, defect team has been reinstated, although it's unclear to me as to why it was discontinued in the first place. Certainly, the most important action the commission can take is to help strengthen protections for children. While there have been many successes this Congress here at the committee and at the commission, there's still many areas where the CPSC needs to improve its operations, especially as we consider the agency's budget. Under the leadership of the previous two acting chairs, the commission fell into disrepair. Since the last time we had you here, the CPSC experienced a massive data breach of all its confidential uh, incident data held by the commission, imposed a six-month COVID-19 pandemic closure of port ins inspections, shuttered CPSC lab testing in support of enforcement and the development of the sturdy rule, 
accumulated around 200 open inspector general recommendations and reports showing a culture of mismanagement of agency funds and has started to stray from its core mission in pursuit of a more politicized agenda with initiatives like a rule to ban gas stoves in the name of consumer protection when it is clearly just a backdoor attempt to advance the current administration's radical green agenda. More troubling still are the claims from your own inspector general that his independence was under attack. While many of the IG's recommendations have been closed out related to these specific incidences, the commissioners need to ensure a culture at the agency that respects the IG's independence. The CPSC plays an important role in helping to protect the American people from dangerous products. The agency is at its best when it's fulfilling its core mission through enhancing security at our ports, protecting our kids, and ensuring companies are in compliance with the law. I look forward to discussing how to best ensure CPSC is adhering to its core mission and how we can continue to work together to keep the American people safe. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the chair, and now I'll recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome Chairman Ozarek back to the committee. It's great to see you and, and the other commissioners here today. Um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has a long history of ensuring that everyday products are safe. And one product of particular concern to me is the grave danger posed to small children by water beads. Water beads are very small beads made of super absorbent material that can expand up to 100 times their original size when exposed to liquid. And they are marketed as colorful, fun toys for kids. But when swallowed by a small child, they can cause serious injury or even death. And water bead injuries resulted in about 7,000 emergency room visits between 2018 and 2022. So the CPSC has used the legal authorities at, at its disposal to warn parents and remove some water bead toys from the market. And the commission issued a recall for a water beads activity kit marketed for older children that tragically resulted in the death of a 10-month-old Esther Bedhart in Wisconsin. And this product has also injured many others. The CPSC also published a general safety alert to warn parents of the ingestion risk to young children posed by any water bead product and to direct that water beads should be removed from any environment with young children. Now, these are important actions that will save children's lives. And I do want to say that, you know, the, this agency has just done so many things like that for consumer protection. But with regard to water beads, Congress has to do more to empower the CPSC to protect babies and children from this danger. And so I introduced the Ban Water Beads Act that would ban water beads marketed for kids. And this ban would remove the most dangerous water bead products from stores and online marketplaces and allow the CPSC to go after bad actors who put their own bottom lines ahead of children's safety. Water beads really are deadly. We must act quickly to ensure that no more children die from ingesting these dangerous water beads. I wanted to thank Ashley Haugen, founder of the nonprofit That Water Bead Lady, and her husband for being here today. Their daughter, Kipley, faces ongoing medical challenges after swallowing water beads that were part of a toy belonging to her older sister. Ashley has turned this tragedy that she and her family endured into passionate advocacy to protect other children from dangerous water bead products. I also wanted to thank Taylor Bedhart, whose daughter, Esther, died after swallowing water beads, and Felicia Mitchell, whose daughter, Kennedy, was hospitalized for four weeks after swallowing a single water bead. And I want to commend them and all the parents fighting to ban water beads for their bravery, selfless advocacy, and commitment to banning these dangerous products once and for all. But the CPSC can only do the work to protect kids from the dangers of water beads and many other products if Congress gives them the resources to do it. Every American benefits from a strong, active, and well-funded CPSC. Unfortunately, their current budget is woefully inadequate and has forced it to reduce staff responsible for safety research, enforcement, and surveillance of thousands of consumer products. And House Republicans are now proposing a 6% cut to the CPSC's budget for fiscal year 2025, which will make it even harder for them to protect Americans from dangerous products. And Republicans are also pushing 
Trump's Project 2025, a dangerous blueprint for a potential second Trump administration that proposes eliminating the independence of federal agencies like the CPSC. Trump's Project 2025 is a plan to consolidate power in the White House and gut checks and balances. This would be a disastrous move that would seriously undermine the CPSC's ability to enforce critical safety standards, put families at risk, and remove accountability for huge corporations. So, I mean, clearly that's the wrong course to protect the Americans from dangerous products. Without more resources, the CPSC will not be able to stay ahead of emerging threats or provide strong enforcement to keep dangerous products off physical and virtual store shelves. Our economy has and will continue to become increasingly global and digital, which requires the CPSC to develop innovative solutions to tackling threats in e-commerce and our children's physical safety depends on the work of the CPSC, and I'm committed to fighting for the resources and the additional authority they need to protect Americans from unnecessary risk. Let me just conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman, by saying I've always felt that protecting consumers is one of the most important uh, parts of this committee, and I think that the CPSC has really um, you know, worked with us on a number of these initiatives. Um, I'm very proud of what you all do. Um, but at the same time, you need the resources uh, because the, the list of uh, consumer products that are dangerous uh, just keeps growing. So thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we're going to begin now with the witnesses. Uh, witnesses today are the five commissioners of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, and uh, the ranking member uh, has requested that the chair uh, – testify first, and the chair is Alexander Hohn, Sarek, of course. So at, I will accommodate that request. So uh, chair, you are recognized for your five minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Villarakis, Ranking Member Schakowsky, Chair McMorris Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting us to testify here today. As many of you mentioned, as a former committee staffer, it's really my privilege to be here before you today, now as chair of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Over 50 years ago, Congress established the CPSC to protect consumers from unreasonably risk of injury and death from consumer products. Our mission has grown to encompass more than 15,000 category of products, representing over $2 trillion in commerce annually, including about a $1 trillion in imports. The agency is made up of committed, hardworking uh, staff dedicated to CPSC's mission, and it's thanks to them that the CPSC has been incredibly productive despite operating under a budget that's far smaller than incomparable federal safety agencies. Um, in my time as chair, we've conducted over 800 recalls and issued more than 80 product safety warnings. We've issued more than 150 thousand takedown requests to online marketplaces for recall, banned, and violative products. We've issued standards improving the safety of products ranging from button cell batteries to crib mattresses to adult portable bed rails. We've intercepted approximately 25 million violative products ports. We've assessed more than $109 million in civil penalties, which goes to the Treasury, and we've reached consumers more than 10 billion times with safety messages about drowning prevention infant safe sleep practices, carbon monoxide poisoning, and more. These are not just statistics. These are actions taken by the agency in response to deaths and injuries and to prevent future harm. The, with the agency doing its work, there are fewer trips to the emergency room and fewer deaths across this great nation. And with our focus on infant and child safety, countless tragedies have been avoided and families have been kept whole. Our agency's recent productivity gains are partially due to an increase in congressional support, both in a one-time appropriations under the American Rescue Plan and an increase in FY23 funding. Our current and prospective funding levels put that progress in danger. This year, CPSC's appropriation was reduced to just $151 million. To address this year's budget cut and the coming depletion of agency's ARPA funds, We've decreased our staff from a high of 583 to about 548 currently, and we anticipate further reductions through attrition. As a result, important work is delayed, import inspections are slowed, and consumers are facing more risk. Our FY25 budget request is 
$3 million, which would help us address these issues. It aligns also with Congress's expectations for us. As we mentioned, the House recently passed four bills requiring the CPSC to issue safety rules on lithium ion batteries, retractable awnings, to ban high concentration sodium nitrite, and to establish an artificial intelligence pilot program. Unfortunately, the House Appropriations Committee approved an FY25 funding decrease of 6% to a level of 142 million. Implementing this cut would result in widespread staff reductions, which would be devastating for consumer safety and for the agency. At some point in time, we can't do more with less. We can simply do less. The fiscal threat is happening at a time when product safety challenges facing Americans are growing. E-commerce is booming, but so are the number of hazardous and recall products sold online through online platforms. Americans routinely buy from foreign manufacturers through platforms that do little, if any, vetting of the manufacturers or their products. I'm grateful for the bipartisan leaders of this committee who are pushing these platforms to prioritize product safety, and I'd welcome additional congressional action to hold them accountable. The platforms are in the best position to evaluate the safety of the products that are being offered on those sites. That burden should not rest on the American consumer. CPSC is also confronting new technologies, such as AI, that can change lives but also raise its potential new risks. CPSC needs to expand its expertise in this and other areas, but without sufficient funds, I fear we're gonna miss the next deadly hazard. Finally, we can continue to see disproportionate deaths and injury rates for certain products in certain underserved communities. The CPSC has delivered targeted education campaigns to these communities, but future efforts are at risk without sufficient funding. In closing, CPSC provides a tremendous value for the funds that are provided us. We save lives, we prevent injuries, but without adequate funding, we can't maintain our current efforts. So thank you and I look forward to your questions. I thank the, uh, the chair. Uh, our next witness is uh, Richard Tromka. Uh, Richard Tronka Jr., and you're recognized for five minutes. Chairs McMorris Rogers and Bill Arrakis, Ranking Members Pallone and Schakowsky, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our agency's life-saving mission. Tomorrow would have been my father's birthday, and that's led me to reflect on a core value that he held while he was still with us. That a lifetime of service to others is the most important dedication one can make. And so I'm proud to serve with the over 500 career staff at the CPSC who embody that ideal every day as we work to protect the public from hazards in more than 15,000 product categories. In trying to describe the character of our agency's workforce, I'll borrow a description I heard from a Michigan firefighter. He talked about problem solvers. And he said, when problem solvers come upon death and tragedy that they couldn't prevent, it's like adding a rock to an invisible backpack that they'll wear for the rest of their lives. People of the CPSC signed up to shoulder a heavy burden because they're committed to making the world safer for us all. The agency's mission weighs heaviest for me each time I meet with parents who have suffered the unimaginable tragedy of losing a child or having them grievously injured to a consumer product. People like Myra Romero Furman, Trista Hamsmith, Linda Kaiser, and Ashley Haugen. I hear them and I stand with them. We cry together and we look for solutions together. They bear more weight than anyone should. Yet instead of being dragged down, they advocate for safety in the hope that they can stop others from carrying the weight that they do. Every night after I read bedtime stories to my two young kids, I read a report of every consumer product related to death that the agency learned about in the country that day. 25, 30, sometimes more than 40 deaths. Babies who died in their sleep, people who died from carbon monoxide poisoning. I go to sleep thinking about those lives cut short and about their family's heartbreak. And I ask myself if I've done everything I could that day to carry the weight and service to those that we've lost and those that we can still protect. We also lighten those loads every time products are made safer. We did that with rules to stop child strangulations and window blinds, to protect kids from death and injury from magnets and button batteries, to stop dressers from crushing kids, to eliminate crib bumpers and incline sleepers to save babies' lives, and to stop gruesome deaths of older Americans from bed rails. And the people of the CPSC are working on rules to save over 100 more lives per year from carbon monoxide poisoning, save another 100 lives per year from toxic inhalation of aerosol dusters, and save dozens of infant per infants per year from sleep deaths. As hundreds of families grow old together, instead of facing tragedy from those products, we will lighten the load. 
CPSC is also getting more hazardous products out of homes. Last year, the agency collaborated on 313 voluntary recalls with companies, most in recent memory, and we're set to shatter that this year. When companies won't collaborate with us on recalls, we're giving consumers the knowledge to protect themselves. We're issuing unilateral recalls about hazards at a record pace. Public health information belongs to the American people, and when we warn the public about hazards that we can't immediately fix, we lighten the load. I come from a family of coal miners, so I know that working families pay the price when they're kept in, dark, in the dark on safety issues. Both of my grandfathers died from black lung that they got in the mines. With information, they could have protected themselves. Safety information belongs in the hands of retailers, too. They've proven that they want to keep their customers safe. They stopped selling product categories like water beads and weighted infant swaddles when they learned of CPSC's warnings for consumers not to use them, and they've lightened that load. Our port inspectors lighten the load when they seize dangerous products at America's borders, products coming in disproportionately from China. Holding bad actors accountable also lightens the load and deters others, like the first ever criminal convictions in our act's history, and like the $19 million civil, uh, Peloton civil penalty for failing to report a hazard that saw 29 children pulled under treadmills and injured and one child's death. And I started by mentioning the importance of service. And I'm constantly inspired by both the people of the CPSC and an example set in my own family. My wife is brilliant. She's got a Cornell biology degree. She could be doing absolutely anything she wants in the world. But she's felt called to serve our community in a special education classroom. And I'm proud to say that she was just named the Montgomery County, Maryland Paraeducator of the Year in a job that's too often thankless. Our kids got to see her recognized for her amazing service and got to learn about the importance of service. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. And now we'll, uh, our next witness is uh, Douglas Siak. Uh, and you're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Bilirakis, Ranking Member Schakowsky, Chair McMorris-Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of this subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to join my colleagues here today to discuss the Consumer Product Safety Commission fiscal year 2025 budget. Chairman Bilirakis, I especially want to thank you and your staff for providing the hospitality when we visited you and your constituents at the Starkey Ranch Theater. When we met in February, you predicted my confirmation was imminent, and your crystal ball must have been very clear that day because I was confirmed by the United States Senate eight days later. In addition to the Commission's budget, I want to discuss some of the successes that we've enjoyed during my tenure, present some of my priorities that I believe the Commission should focus on. Speaking first to the budget, budgets, be they this Commission's, the federal budget, or the budgets millions of Americans put together in their homes to help, help manage the present and plan for the future. They require that priorities be set and choices, sometimes difficult, be made. Unrealistic budget requests are of limited utility for planning and operational management. My colleagues and I will soon begin work on the Commission's operating plan, which will require us to make those difficult resource decisions. I look forward to working with my colleagues to put together a thoughtful plan. Budgeting is but one part of a Commissioner's job. Working with stakeholders is another. One of my priorities is to be available to all stakeholders. One of the best examples of why this approach matters came from listening sessions Commissioner Feldman and I had with the Eastern Shoshone Tribe on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. Council Chairman John St. Clair pointed out, when conducting informational and educational campaigns aimed at Native Americans, the Commission should and needed to understand the challenges his members faced. He noted that many members of the Eastern Shoshone spend a lot of time in their cars listening to the radio. He went on to explain the challenges of internet and phone connectivity in rural areas like the Wind River Reservation. Consequently, he noted, internet, social media, and other common commission means for reaching consumers with messaging would be limited on the reservation. Later, Commissioner Feldman and I helped steer a new safety campaign utilizing over-the-air radio and billboards for Native American communities whose infants are 2.7 times more likely than non-Hispanic white infants to die from accidental causes before their first birthday. Thanks to his suggestion during our meetings, the Commission is now reaching more Native American communities with life-saving safety and educational information. We accomplish this by listening. I maintain an open-door policy for all stakeholders, including those harmed by safe, unsafe products, their families, safety advocates, 
safety professionals, and the business community that ultimately implements safety improvements. There are no monopoly on good ideas. There is no monopoly on good ideas. My experience has also taught me that government efforts can be siloed. I want to work with this committee, entities like the Government Accountability Office, and our sister agencies to understand where our collective efforts can be leveraged and efficiencies gained. What example of this collaboration is the success we see at our ports of entry and the work our port inspectors do with the United States Customs and Border Patrol? While increases in our appropriations could be put to many uses, based on the growth in the Commission's most recent appropriations, I believe we must plan conservatively. This means we will need to find ways to work harder and do more with less. I, for example, I believe one method for doing this would be considering leveraging relationships with higher education, higher educational institutions where appropriate and feasible. Let me turn briefly to some of my priorities that I would like to focus on as a commissioner. One is the safety of old Amer older Americans who face an annual, an average annual injury rate of three million injuries associated with consumer products. Second, I want to work to reduce the number of fail failed childhood drownings. Drownings, which result in roughly 4,000 deaths each year, is the leading cause of death for children ages one to four, and unfortunately, overall deaths, according to CDC data, have been rising. Finally, I want to work with my colleagues toward our joint goal of improving e-commerce safety. With regard to e-commerce, these sales, sales platforms must do a better job with respect to the sale of dangerous consumer products, and in certain instances, the illegal resale of recalled products. Commission's responsibility covers thousands of consumer products. Increasingly, we face the emergence of direct-to-consumer sales from foreign e-commerce platforms such as Shein and Timu that allow for the purchase of products directly from overseas manufacturers, especially from China, where manufacturers may not be concerned with safety, American safety regulations and laws. New issues arise each day in this job, but these are the, some, of the, some of the issues that keep me awake, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my views. and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I appreciate you coming down to the district. Uh, it was very informative, uh, very informative uh, presentation. We appreciate it very much. Next is uh, Mary Boyle, uh, and Commissioner Boyle, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Villarakis, Ranking Member Schakowsky, Chair McMorris Rogers, and uh, Ranking Member Pallone, and distinguished members of the committee. It is an honor to testify on the important work the Consumer Product Safety Commission does to execute its mission to protect American consumers. For the past two years, I've had the privilege of fulfilling that mission through my service as a commissioner. My work today draws upon expertise developed over more than a decade of service at CPSC in a variety of roles, including as general counsel and executive director. I am deeply committed to the agency's mission, a mission that our talented and dedicated staff pursues day in and day out using the tools and resources Congress provides. I also recognize that CPSC's work requires a commitment to collaboration and that multiple stakeholders play important roles in, in ensuring that products are safe. Indeed, by statute, responsibility for product safety is distributed to both the agency and to industry participants. Industry, no doubt, should play a critical role by making safe products in the first place. But when potential problems arise, the law requires companies to act and to act quickly by reporting those issues to CPSC. That reporting obligation confirms that the statutory scheme envisions product safety to be a shared endeavor. The crux of this dual responsibility stems from the fact that CPSC does not confer pre-market approval on products. That may come as a surprise to many Americans who may assume the products they buy have been vetted in advance by the government. In fact, CPSC must rely on voluntary standards if there is wide compliance with an effective industry standard. Because the Consumer Product Safety Act assigns important obligations to industry, CPSC must be vigilant in using all its authorities when companies do not meet their obligations. That is why I support significant civil penalties for companies that fail to timely report information to CPSC and believe that a higher statutory maximum penalty is in order. Companies with revenues in the hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars may see the current statutory maximum of just over 17 million as the cost of doing business. I also support robust enforcement of the law. 
CPSC is the cop on the beat, and we must not hesitate to enforce the law against bad actors and companies that fail to take responsibility for the safety of their products. The Commission's work protecting the most vulnerable consumers, infants and young children, has been especially important to me, and I appreciate Congress's leadership in this area. The Safe Sleep for Babies Act, the Sturdy Act, and Reese's Law have all strengthened our hand considerably in protecting the youngest Americans. Although the agency has adopted relatively few regulations compared to the thousands of product categories within its jurisdiction, mandatory standards are essential when industry fails to establish and comply with effective voluntary standards. As an example, I would point to the Commission's unanimous approval in 2022 of a regulation for adult portable bed rails, which posed entrapment and suffocation risks that fell disproportionately on seniors and disabled individuals. Despite nearly 300 fatalities, effective voluntary standards were not put into place necessitating mandatory requirements. Notably, more than 70% of the incidents involved female victims. Although CPSC staff was unable to determine a reason for this finding, life expectancy alone did not account for the stark difference. I was therefore pleased to receive unanimous support for my amendment to the agency's operating plan directing research on safety hazards for older consumers, including an evaluation of gender disparities. I am mindful that the use of female crash dummies in the auto safety context is relatively new, and I believe that gender differences can similarly shape risk profiles for consumer products. CPSC must also play an essential role in addressing new or emerging product hazards born of innovation and fast-paced changes in technology. Although there are many products that illustrate this point, I offer e-bikes as an example, where innovations are outpacing safety to the detriment of consumers, particularly children. The Commission heard testimony, for example, about one county's experience with sharply increased rates of e-bike accidents and severity of injuries among 10 to 15-year-old riders. I applaud the work of this committee for addressing the fire hazard associated with lithium ion batteries used in e-bikes and other devices that will surely help save lives. But more needs to be done to ensure that safety keeps pace with the burgeoning use of e-bikes and the corresponding rise in deaths and injuries unrelated to fires we are seeing. Despite obvious differences in weight, speed, brakes, and other mechanical attributes, e-bikes are currently regulated as traditional pedal bicycles. I am encouraged that the Commission has taken an initial step through a recent advance notice of proposed rulemaking to collect information from the public on e-bikes and how to address them. With e-bikes and so much more, CPSC faces a wide range of revolving challenges. To meet those challenges, it is imperative that the agency be provided adequate resources, and as this committee considers the budget, I respectfully request that you support funding at levels that will allow us to effectively protect American consumers. Lives literally are at stake. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I thank the general lady. Our next witness, our final witness, is uh, Peter Feldman, and you're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Bill Rockus, Ranking Member Schakowsky, uh, Chair Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, Chairman Bill Rockus, uh, before I begin, I, I wanted to let you know how much uh, Commissioner Ziak and I enjoyed visiting you in Newport Ritchie uh, to discuss our work and to hear directly from your constituents about how we can serve them better. CPSC's budget is a critical planning and management tool reflecting the agency's vast jurisdiction and the important safety mission that we carry. While I believe we can do more with less, there are also areas where additional resources could be helpful, including further expansion of our compliance and import surveillance capabilities. Budget requests that are not grounded in realistic assumptions about our appropriations level aren't useful as planning and management tools. I've also voted against budget requests that don't fully reflect my priorities. But good management is based on measurable results. Strategic increases where we can demonstrate uh, return on investment are worthy of congressional consideration. Since I last appeared before the subcommittee, I've worked to make specific investments within our existing appropriation that I'd like to highlight today. CPSC's port inspectors are the frontline workers who assess, screen, and interdict dangerous consumer goods entering the United States before they ever make it into consumer hands. These shipments often originate in countries that don't respect our laws, such as China. For American families, every seizure of a dangerous or violative product yields a commensurate reduction in the risk of illness, injury, or death. To put it simply, CPSC port inspectors save American lives. During the COVID-19 pandemic, CPSC's acting chairman chose to withdraw from the ports, sending our inspectors home for months on end. During this time, screenings and interdictions dropped to zero despite the full resumption of trade and our partner agencies never having abandoned their posts. 
that was wrong and American consumers deserve better. Over objections, I pushed to restart this essential function and to secure the largest port inspector hiring blitz in the agency's history. Screenings are now at an all-time high and our team is working more effectively than ever. Let's look at the numbers. CPSC expanded the number of inspectors by 70% in the fiscal year 2022, up from its pre-pandemic low, prioritizing both high volume ports and those regularly processing inbound e-commerce e shipments. Scre screenings were bounded by more than 350%. These inspections have led to increased seizures with almost 14 million, million violative products seized within the last year, a 320% increase from our pandemic lows. Each of these seizures represents a dangerous product that didn't reach American homes. And almost certainly, emergency room visits that never happened, homes that are still standing, and funerals that were never planned. When CPSC finds hazardous or violative products being shipped into the country or posted online, the Office of Compliance is our enforcement team. It issues violations, negotiates recalls, and pursues civil and criminal penalties where appropriate. When I arrived at CPSC, this team needed attention after significant neglect. I secured the first funding increase compliance had seen in years. I then secured an additional 30% increase, representing the largest single investment in the office's history. These were not additional budget requests to Congress, just a more responsible allocation of resources Congress had provided our agency. I don't know why previous agency leadership disbanded our children's product defect team, but I worked to reinstate it because protecting children is our highest priority. Again, let's look at the numbers. Last fiscal year, our team negotiated 313 recalls and is bringing bigger and more consequential cases against firms that flout the law. This fiscal year, CPSC saw its first ever criminal convictions. These investments are paying dividends. CPSC is a more muscular agency than it used to be, and those that violate the law or import low quality goods from abroad should be on notice this commission is focused and resolved to enforce our statute. In conclusion, I'm pleased to report that comedy among the commissioners is as high as I've experienced since my arrival, something that I know Congress has cared about historically. This would not be possible without the work of our chairman, Alex Ansarik. I've been critical of past leadership when they've fallen short, and I'm not afraid to pay compliments where they're due. I want to acknowledge him for his leadership. I also want to recognize my colleagues, Commissioner Trumka, Boyle, Ziak, all of whom share the goal of keeping Americans safe. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, now I'll begin the questioning. Uh, so I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Chair, says Sarah, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Uh, thank you again for being here uh, before. So the Commission's uh, Inspector General does great work. I believe you could better utilize appropriated funds uh, by following recommendations the IG provides in recent reports sent to Congress. Are you familiar with the fiscal year 23 financial uh, statement audit? I am. Okay, thank you. In that report, outside uh, independent auditors identified many troubling findings. This report painted a picture of lost money missed deadlines, and other troubling issues. I'm also aware that uh, FISMA assessment from uh, fiscal year 2023 found that the commission failed to meet deadlines for IT security improvements. It certainly seems that you might be able to have more funds on hand if there was a better handle on the use of taxpayer dollars. Are you, are you as the chair, giving the IG all the cooperation he requires to identify and reduce waste at the commission, sir? Uh, yes, sir, we are. We're working with the IG. I think he's doing important work. I would note with our, our financial statement, there was no allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, it was a focus on depreciation and accruals, which was, uh, we changed auditors and they had a different perspective than our prior auditor, but that actually has no effect on the budget side of things with, uh, for, for the federal government because we don't deal with accruals and, and depreciation like a private sector company does. Um, with respect to the IG, I know that he is um, looking to hire. We're supporting that and actually in our uh, FY25 budget, we have allocated uh, an increase of three people for his offices. So um, I think the, uh, an increase in our funding would go across the agency to include the IGs as well. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I want to discuss the cost of the commission's uh, real estate uh -huh. next. I know uh, CPSC has continued to authorize staff to work from home in a hybrid manner uh, multiple days a week. While I think it is important for staff to be in the building, uh, most of all, in my opinion, that they should be in the building, uh, in most days in, anyway, I'm, I'm open to remote flexibilities, as I said, if it does not negatively impact productivity and could save taxpayer money. In fact, the commission's uh, for fiscal year 23 capital plan called for returning just over half of the current office space to GSA, which could have resulted in a projected savings of $2.4 million, taxpayer dollars. However, in the, 20, the fiscal uh, year 24 uh, capital plan, that number shrunk to returning only 12% of the space, and without a cost-saving estimate notably absent from the fiscal year 24 plan. So the chair, I ask the chair again, can you tell us why that number shrank from the previous year, and also can you tell us what current occupancy uh, utilization rate, uh, what it is, the, the current rate, please? Sure, we're returning about 15,000 square feet um, to the process, which uh, will result in savings for the agency. The analysis was done consistent with GAO's um, analysis, how many square feet are appropriate per employee. That will take us to the GAO, GSA's um, uh, criteria. Um, in that, uh, we are working consistent. We are op open to looking at more ways to be able to um, examine whether this additional space that we can uh, give back there are complications always with that, both in terms of the labs that we have. We need those labs, and, we, and it's not a matter of giving space back in those labs. Uh, with respect to things like, you know, it's been suggested that we give up conference rooms. Um, fortunately, we can't give up individual conference rooms within our building because you can't rent out space within the middle. So suggestions like those, obviously, we, we can't look at. But overall, we are looking to squeeze wherever we can. And that is a process that takes months on end working with GSA to return those properties. So we will look to, to see if there are other ways to, um, to get an extra dollar out, but we can only do what we can do. I encourage you to do so, obviously. Uh, in my opening, I guess I gotta yield back. I, I'll submit the questions. I wanna be fair to everyone. So I'll recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Schakowsky, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some things I want to talk to you about. Um, the um, CPSC is already one of the very smallest agencies um, right now in, in government. And, but I have to say that your work is probably closest to home. I'm talking about, about every individual homes of Americans across the, across the country. Um, and, the, and that families are participants in what you do. I have worked with so many families whose children have been harmed and come to you, and you want to be there. All of you want to be there for, for, for them. And I, I just feel like such a small agency where you have about 500 uh, employees um, and um, five, what is that, five, how many, how many uh, five, five, five million <laughs> that, you have, that, you have to, that you have to take care of? So I, I'm a little offended by the idea that we're picking out an agency that does so much for so many and that, you know, we have to look at whether or not we have to get rid of rooms, and et cetera. I, I believe in efficiency. There's no question about it. Um, but I wanted to, again, to say what are some of the things that people will really feel if the budget is cut? Thank you for the question. If the budget is cut, like has been suggested by House Appropriations, it will result in fewer people. Already we're down about 35 people from, from our uh, high. That means there are gonna be less people at the ports, which means that there's gonna be more dangerous products coming into the, the country. That means there's gonna be less people working in compliance, which means that there'll probably be fewer recalls and less people to go after the bad actors who are out there. 
There are going to be less people who are going to be at the labs, who are going to be looking at the dangers that the, the, the people on the committee have spoken about. There's going to be less people on our communication side. So we aren't going to be getting out the message about drowning prevention, about how to protect people from carbon monoxide poisoning following hurricanes. All in all, across the board, we're going to see less work, more dangers for American consumers. So you um, mentioned um, the ports, but also online marketplaces. Um, could you use um, more funding and more tools um, and maybe more authorities in order to make sure that you can find those products that come from overseas, China, yeah. et cetera? More and more of the products that consumers are buying are being bought uh, through e-commerce, and it's become a tremendous issue, both in terms of our ability to uh, go after the manufacturers when there's a problem. Too often, we'll reach out to a company that's manufactured a defective product that's overseas in China or other places, and they simply won't respond to us. And so at that point in time, we're left not being able to do more than give a warning, and consumers left with a dangerous product in their home. Those products really are, are going through these e-commerce platforms which should be doing more to be able to vet the, the products that are being offered on their sites and to be able to give recourse to, to consumers. Similarly, the number of products that are coming in is just growing, and we only have a limited number of people at the ports. So for us, it is the money is necessary to do that enforcement and to do the, the stopping the products at the ports. I just have a couple of seconds. I just wonder what you, you have done um, a lot on the um, issue of protecting kids from sleepers, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to thank you for that. I see that I am out of time. Oh, no, you, I guess I'm okay. not. You still have a little bit. I'm sorry? Yeah, you have another almost. Okay. Time. Yeah, if, if you could um, talk a little bit more um, and light, enlighten us on the work that you have been doing on um, the, the important work on children. So we have been very active uh, protecting children. We have a number of uh, rulemakings that are actually open at this point in time. We did a, a uh, rule proposal to make nursing pillows safer. We did a rule proposal to make infant cushions safer. Um, those are uh, near the end of the process, and I would predict that the staff would likely send a final rule proposal up to us um, we've done a tremendous amount implementing the Safe Sleep for Babies Act that you all passed and have directed us. And at this point in time, for us, it's an enforcement mechanism, um, uh, enforcement for us, which we are dedicating resources to and making sure the law that you pass is being put into operation. It's great work. We're happy to partner with you on that in the, from the, our subcommittee. Thank you very much. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Now I'll recognize the chair of the full committee, Mrs. Rogers, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Chair Holland Sarek, thank you and your fellow commissioners for being here today and for what your career staff do uh, to protect children, all of you. As chair, do you believe you have a firm grasp on directing the agent the agenda of the commission and managing the current resources allocated to the CPSC? Uh, I have a good grasp of what's going on. The direction of the agency as a whole is done to the level of the commission. The operations um, is my responsibility as manager. Are there any areas where you think the CPSC could save money? Would acting with more consensus, such as with five to zero votes, allow the commission to operate more efficiently? Uh, we always try to get to consensus on our, our actions. I think our most recent operating plan was generally supported by the, all the commissioners. Um, so that is an opportunity that we do every year to do an operating plan so that everybody's thoughts can be put forward and we can give a general direction to the staff as to what's the uh, highest priorities. Okay. Wouldn't such consensus result in savings on potential litigation costs for the CPSC if rulemakings are conducted in a manner that does not invite successful legal challenge? Um, unfortunately, uh, I found that, that regardless of what we do, we tend to be sued. So uh, anytime we do a rule, anytime we do most actions, we, we end up in court, which is unfortunate, um, but uh, sometimes inevitable, inevitable. Okay, in the post-Chevron world, federal agencies are limited 
to the plain meaning of statutes. To me, that means no personnel, uh, personnel time should be spent on developing novel legal theories to expand their regulatory authority. Is this an opportunity for the CPSC to rethink how you're using limited resources? I think as a general matter, the CPSC has been conservative in its approach to be able to look at the plain reading of the, the statutes that Congress has provided to us. Uh, I understand um, the Supreme Court's recent uh, decision, and I think that will also inform us going forward to make sure that we are looking at it, what the plain reading of the language is. Thank you. In the case of outside contractors used by the CPSC, are, there, are those all done through a bidding process? Uh, we do it consistent with the FAR's uh, requirements. Um, some of them are bidding process, some of them are single source. It's my understanding that the commission has engaged in multiple no-bid contracts, totaling around $4 million. The no-bid contracts I'm that I'm aware of have all been awarded to just one individual. Are you aware of that? Uh, I believe you're talking about the Boise State contract, yes. Commissioner Feldman, thank you for your long service at the CPSC. As I mentioned, I appreciate the work of the chair and the commitment he's shown to improve the condition of this agency. With any government agency, there's always areas for improvement. Uh, given my line of questioning, where do you see improvements in cost savings and consensus building at the commission? Uh, chair Rogers, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of consensus building, I, I appreciate your recognition of the progress we have made. We don't agree on everything, but the vast majority of the agency's important safety work is uh, agreed to unanimously. Uh, you asked about cost savings. Um, a significant portion of the agency's budget uh, is directed at salaries and expenses. Uh, the Biden administration's mandated 5% salary increase puts significant strain on our operational budget. I'm not proposing salary cuts or a reduction in force. In fact, I want to protect the critical hires that we made to strengthen our uh, import surveillance and compliance teams but we find ourselves in a particularly lean posture. Okay, thank you. Uh, we certainly understand this all has to be a two-way street. I'm pleased that we have a five-member commission and that you all are here today answering these questions and look forward to continuing to work with you. I yield back. I thank the chair now I'll recognize the ranking member for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this Congress, this subcommittee, has advanced legislation requiring, as was mentioned before, I think uh, the chairman mentioned it, that requiring the CPSC to take action to address hazards caused by lithium ion batteries, motorized retractable awnings, high concentration sodium nitrate in pools and spas. And I have every confidence in your ability to implement these pieces of legislation and keep our children and their families safe. However, as I mentioned in my opening, adequate funding is critical to make these goals a reality, yet Congress keeps asking you to do more with less. And when House Republicans threaten to make cuts to CPSC's budget, they're putting, or they have the potential of putting children's lives in danger and corporate profits over the safety of their constituents. But I'm particularly concerned about stifling the CPSC's ongoing efforts on water beads, as I mentioned before, which poses a known and active threat to young children. So I wanted to ask the chair, can you provide an update on the steps the CPSC is taking to address the risk posed to young children by water beads, and how would clear direction from Congress and full funding for the agencies accelerate your actions and get these dangerous products out of the hands of young children as soon as possible? And you know, I, of course, a large part of why I'm aware of this is because of what you've already done, but if you would just give us an update. Ranking member, as, as you have stated in your opening, we have an active education campaign out to consumers about the dangers associated with water beads. There was a recall. And we've warned about other uh, water bead products that have high levels of curlamide, which could be uh, harmful to children if swallowed. Um, and uh, so in addition to that, we have in our work plan to be able to put out a notice of proposed rulemaking to regulate water beads as well. Clearly, this is, uh, even with our education campaign, there's dangers out there. There was an article just the other day about a daycare center in which um, multiple children ended up swallowing water beads. One of, them, one of the people is, was in critical condition and two others were in the emergency room and getting medical treatment as a result. So uh, we are moving forward, but our rules take a long time. Action by Congress could speed through all of that and get a clear, um, and as you know, the chair had said, we often get sued. You provide clarity to the marketplace and you can do it quickly through a law. Well, thank you. And um, 
the next question I had, Mr. Chairman, was about was brought up in part by uh, Ranking Member Schakowsky. As part of the American Rescue Plan, the CPSC was given funds to strengthen port surveillance and enforcement for the massive influx of e-commerce shipments into the U.S. And we know that e-commerce marketplace is growing and more consumer products are being shipped from foreign countries to American consumers. So when do you expect the additional funds included in this American Rescue Plan law to run out? And what would be the impact on port surveillance and e-commerce enforcement if additional funds are not appropriated? I know that uh, Ms. Schakowsky mentioned this, but I just wanted you to dwell, you know, a little more detail. We anticipate the ARPA funds to run out at the beginning of next year. Currently, we have 17 port staff who are funded through the ARPA funds. We would have to figure out either how to incorporate them in, but given the, the cut that the House is talking about, um, that would just um, be devastating for the agency. All right, let me just ask you one more thing here. Um, could you just describe the challenges that the agency faces when attempting to hold online marketplaces and businesses accountable and what more Congress can do to help in that regard. So uh, we often have trouble getting a hold of the companies that are selling through these online marketplaces if they're based overseas. And honestly, if they're just based overseas, there's not a whole lot that we can do about them. They often disappear and we can't um, push for a recall, we can just push for warnings. Really, the question is, but for consumers, when they're shopping online, they expect the same level of service and protection that they get at the corner market, and they should get that. So, you know, having a you know, reaffirmation of our authority um, with respect to online marketplaces, and honestly, online marketplaces really are in the best position to do even more, to be able to vet, vet their manufacturers, vet the products on there and make sure they're safe before they're offered to consumers. And uh, honestly, in addition to that, the, the legislation that Ms. Schakowsky has is a critical part of that. We have a cap of $17 million for our civil penalties. And when you talk about large companies, whether they're online platforms or others, they may have market caps of hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. Um, $17 million is the cost of doing business. It's not a deterrent. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. The gentleman uh, yields back. Now I'll recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, thanks for joining us. Today will be the good, the bad, and the ugly. First, I'd like to commend you for considering the new standard for portable generators. This new standard will require the installation of technology to lower emissions of harmful carbon monoxide. Sadly, we've seen some recent deaths in Texas, Louisiana, resulting from harmful emissions of carbon dioxide um, from some of these generators. These deaths are entirely preventable. The proposed CPSC rule will save lives since it would apply to all companies that make or sell portable generators in the U.S. I hope the CPSC will move as fast as possible to issue this proposed regulation. I'd be interested in the timeline for when that would be issued, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this point in time, we have to provide data on the underlying injuries that, unfortunately, because of the large number of injuries and incidents that you're pointing out, is taking us some time. It's probably more likely to, to be in the coming year as opposed to the, the current year. All right. Unfortunately, I have to contrast the, the good rule that you guys hopefully will roll out with the offer rule on table saws, a rule which kills the table saw industry in my district by mandating the entire industry add patented technology at great cost to the benefit of a single individual. It's simply unacceptable and unconstitutional. And that's why I'm a proud uh, co-sponsor and lead Republican on H.R. 8181, the bipartisan legislation introduced by our Democrat colleague, Ms. Perez, that would overturn this rule. I'm glad that the Appropriations Committee has also included language in this year's bill that would eliminate the funding for this rule, and I hope that you will note the bipartisan nature of our opposition to your work. I would also note that the same FSGG bill also precludes your work on the ill-informed ill rule on off-road vehicles, which are also made in South Carolina. Part of what makes the portable generator rule workable is its reliance on the UL voluntary standard is precisely what's wrong with these other two rules. Rather than allow industry to serve customers with what works, you're trying to overrule them in ways that simply aren't common sense. Commissioner Feldman, uh, I noticed you dissented and provided an extensive statement on the table saw matter. Can you talk about that? Mr. Duncan, I appreciate the question because I am opposed to this rule as currently drafted. I'm concerned that it would add significant cost to the table saws that contractors and hobbyists use every day without offering much in the way of additional safety. 
This isn't a hidden hazard. Uh, the rule would raise significant competition concerns and threatens to concentrate market power in a way uh, that I, I believe would be highly problematic. Monopolies are bad. Government sanctioned monopolies are worse. And SawStop's pledge to dedicate just one of its over 140 patents was a stunt. The patent isn't even the patent it's asserting to keep competitors out of the marketplace, but is currently drafted and giving SawStop's continued litigiousness. I'm not aware that staff has identified a path forward on this rule. At the same time, I'm not sure that there's a majority to remove it from our agenda. Uh, so I do worry that the commission could move to finalize this rule absent clear direction uh, uh, from Congress to the contrary. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, so we've had the good and the bad. Let's bring us to Commissioner Trumka. Um, you have a history of name and shame letters that seek to bully manufacturers uh, with the air of government authority that, let me be clear here, is completely illegitimate. Meanwhile, you famously decline meetings with manufacturers you seek to regulate. You aren't seeking consumer safety. You're just trying to bully American companies, which you don't like. The rulemaking process requires consensus among the commission and allows fairness. Recently, Commissioner Trumpka was allowed to work independently outside the rulemaking process and was successful in shutting down sales of a category of products from being sold at major retailers. He even used CPSC stationery to do so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter in the record a copy of the letter that he, uh, he sent on, uh, on CPSC stationery. Without objection, so order. Thank you. Um, leading some to believe that this was a communication from the full commission. This decision was based on insufficient data and no formal definition of this category of products. This sets the wrong precedence for CPSC against industry, rendering industry's efforts to conduct studies, share data, and work through the processes rather pointless. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, how can a single commissioner be allowed to effectively induce a ban of product category, or ban of a product category without any due process or a commission vote? So uh, as you noted, the, this is not an action of the, of the whole commission. Um, each commissioner has the ability to go and speak their uh, minds and preferences. Um, I have made sure and asked that commissioners be clear about when they're speaking for themselves as opposed to when they're speaking for uh, the, the commission and to, to put that in the writings going forward. Um, but at that point, I, I'm sure you wouldn't want me to tell my you know, Republican colleagues to be quiet and not talk, uh, is each commissioner has the ability to go out, state their preferences. Um, it's important, though, for them to under, for people to understand. Yeah, when but the way it comes them, across so. as as bullying, and it comes across to the industry that it might be an official position of the uh, CPSC. Uh, Commissioner Trumpka took several meetings with consumer advocates. However, he does not respond to industry meeting requests. CPSC is a regulator, not a consumer advocacy organization. How can a commissioner do his or her job without meeting with all the stakeholders? Is that common practice at CPSC? <clears throat> Sir, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, I accept information from all sources. I think it's valuable to do so. I've sometimes declined meeting requests with regulated entities when we have an open agency action, but I'm always willing to accept written information. And I, no, that's I, not what I've been told, but I'll take your word at it. Um, you're also known uh, not to announce meetings on the public calendar in a timely manner or our own time. How can industry rely on CPSC to be fair to all parties when such basic steps encourage inclusivity um, from all stakeholders are repeatedly and intentionally ignored? Oh, I, I, I post all I'll, I'll allow the gentleman to respond, but quickly. Thank you, Thank you sir. I, 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 I post all of my meetings publicly and timely. They're available on the CPSC's website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back. Uh, now I recognize Mr. Soto from the great state of Florida for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all our commissioners on the Consumer Product Safety Commission for the work you do to protect uh, families. You know, in my district, a median age is 34, so a lot of young families with children. And when you look at all these laws that we passed uh, just recently about cribs and dressers, pools, batteries, exercise bikes, awnings, right? Who would have thought awnings, right? And uh, particularly the Virginia Graham Pool Safety Grant Program is, is important for Florida. I've spoken to many firefighters and EMTs who, unfortunately, even in two, three feet of water, uh, a, a child who couldn't swim, the pool wasn't secured, and, and we lost them. Uh, Chair Hone Sarek, uh, first, welcome back to the committee. Uh, thank you for your service. So, you know all the ins and outs of the committee. Uh, we just passed out of the House the Consumer Safety Technology Act. It uh, 
allows for your commission to use AI to track uh, reports of fraud or injury or other things. How important is the use of AI becoming in the work that the Consumer Product Safety Commission is doing? And uh, how important is funding to, to make those efforts go forward? Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, AI is incredibly important, um, both from the internal side for the, the agency to use it and to be able to sort through the terabytes of data that we're getting in from various sources. It's impossible for an, any individual to be able to go through that. You need a system to be able to look through that through artificial intelligence or machine learning to be able to cull out the future hazard patterns and to make sure that we are on top of things and being able to go forward. AI is also incredibly important on the product side of things and making sure that um, we are able to spot the problems and potential products out there. Both of those take a tremendous amount of resources, and we currently don't even have a data a computer scientist who is focused on looking at the, the outside. So I'd love to be able to expand our expertise, but we just don't have the money to do that. Thank you. Mr. Trumpka, thanks for you, you and your family's long history of protecting workers. Uh, you know, over the past couple of years, we saw a one of the largest culture wars ignited over one comment you made about gas stove safety, which was just talking about how you want to keep families safe. Uh, I've, I've never seen an overreaction more than what happened um, because of that comment in the years I've been here. But since there's no actual ban being contemplated, I'd love to give you the opportunity to talk about all the other things you're working on uh, and how important funding is for uh, consumer safety. You had mentioned 30, 40, 20 people each day passing away um, due to faulty products. What, what's the biggest priority we could help you funding-wise to, to, to lower those numbers? Well, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I think as we looked at direction from Congress, when you pass laws like you have been through this committee, um, being as clear as you possibly can with what you'd like us to do is incredibly helpful and in giving us APA rulemaking ability makes it let's, allows us to go quicker. Um, funding for our people at the ports is something that has been raised today. We want to make sure we have the same level of protection at America's ports going forward. And with the ARPA funds expiring, um, that is unclear going forward. So I'd appreciate um, any support you could give us there, sir. Well, we're, you're talking Florida and you're talking ports. You're, you're speaking my and the chairman's language here. So we've we got to help with that, chairman. Uh, and, and then uh, Commissioner Boyle, uh, you had mentioned uh, everything from cons uh, consensus standards to increasing statutory maximums. Um, if the statutory maximums are increased, would that help with uh, some of the funding for the commission? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, actually, the answer is no. Uh, for our civil penalties, it does go to the U.S. Treasury. Um, I, I am supporting, though, an increase in maximums because I think the $17 million, uh, or a little bit above $17 million is just not a sufficient deterrent for companies that have um, revenues in the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, and I want, uh, I think, a higher maximum will incentivize companies to make safety a top priority. I could see how it would go back to the Treasury so we don't create incentives for fines, and that makes a lot of sense. For the industry consensus standards process, you mentioned that industry alone shouldn't be making those standards. How critical is funding for this consensus process? Uh, again, thank you for that question, and I think it's a really important one because our staff does engage with all of the industry consensus standards in, in their development, and having their expertise and their voice at the table is really important, so we have to be funding the staff to be able to participate in those processes. So I, I think it's really important that we have funding to support that process. Thanks, and yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Florida. Now I recognize the other gentleman from Florida. Well, a few uh, everybody's from, from Florida. Florida today, uh, and uh, Dr. Dunn, you're recognized for five minutes. Of thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the commissioners uh, of, of CPSC for being here. Commissioners, you represent a large swath of industry, manufacturing, retail, online marketplaces, home appliances, and more. According to the commission, CPSC is recognized as a global leader in setting consumer product safety standards. Within the agency, you work with foreign, state, and local governments, as well as, of course, private organizations. CPSC has been working directly with China since 2004 through communication channels with Chinese government officials, and in 2011, 
the CPSC established a regional product safety office in Beijing, your only foreign office, I believe. Uh, we've done a lot on the Energy and Commerce Committee as well as Select China Committee, uh, where I also serve to uh, counteract CCP transgressions in trade. Uh, my district includes the Panhandle of Florida, including the port of Panama City, and not to mention, of course, other major ports in Florida like Tampa, Miami, and Jacksonville, where CPSC oversight of imported products is critical to national security. Commissioner Feldman, uh, it's my understanding that during the pandemic, the port inspectors were pulled from their duty stations by the leadership of uh, CPSC when other port inspectors remained. Can you describe the impact of that lack of inspection capacity on consumer products? Congressman Dunn, you're correct. At the beginning of the pandemic, the acting chairman withdrew CPSC port inspectors and kept them home for months on end, despite the full resumption of trade and our partner agencies never having abandoned their posts. During this time, screenings dropped to zero, and the acting chairman concealed the true extent of our operational readiness from Congress and the American people. That was wrong, and I blew the whistle on that mismanagement. Uh, you asked me to describe the impact to consumers. Uh, we can assume that a significant number of violative products entered the country because we weren't screening for things like lead and small parts. I, I agree. In the interest of time, you've agreed, and I agree. I will say, Chairman Hunsarek, that uh, the the diminished port inspection capacity was also affected by the vastly increased e-commerce and de minimis shipping that uh, transitioned almost immediately in the pandemic. So Americans moving from brick and mortar to uh, e-commerce. And, and I'm sure that we saw huge amounts of increased commerce from uh, China, uh, including the uh, companies like Shine and Temu. Uh, so that was, a, I, th I think, a problem we can agree. Uh, so, thank you. By the way, Mr. Chairman, or Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, submit an article for the record uh, entitled Hazardous Goods Found for Sale After Consumer Protection uh, Inspectors Were Pulled from Ports During COVID. I have that article. Without um, objection. Thank you. Chair uh, Honser, the CPSC Statement of Principles regarding the integrity of U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission staff uh, scientific and technical work strategy states, the CPSC aims to conduct this work with an integrity that is beyond reproach because policymakers rely upon this work to make important decisions and because the public place, places its trust in the work of the commission. Uh, Dr. Mannon was the individual the chair referred to uh, earlier in relation to no-bid contracts. Dr. Mannon produced studies which were not peer-reviewed, which the agency relied heavily on as part of its rulemaking and the banning of products, uh, including in, uh, infant uh, sleep products, bassinet strollers, and more. Uh, court filings show that Dr. Mannon has also personally been retained by dozens of plaintiff's attorneys in lawsuits against juvenile products manufacturers across the country receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars based on the work she did for the CPC. How can we possibly believe that Dr. Mannon's work is not biased in any manner based on the millions of taxpayer funding that you guys are providing her in no-bid contracts, and then she turns around and profits a second time selling her testimony as a CPSC expert despite these non-peer-reviewed studies? Did she get these no-bid contracts because she's the only author you could find who agreed with the CPSC's goals? Chairman. Uh, in order to contract, we go through our FARS process that allows for both um, bid and uh, single bid contracts as well. In this case, we'll, we can't do testing on small children safely, so we put out uh, the contracts for others. And so anytime we want to have a process, we both look for expertise at Boise State as well as to be able to look to make sure that any um, children are actually treated safely. Okay, so in the interest of keeping in my time limit, I just want to leave you with a question, Mr. Chairman. Does a non-bid sole source contracting process strike you as, a more like, as more likely to produce an unbiased opinion than the opposite? I think it really depends. I think in this case, they were looking to make sure that uh, we're able to safely test um, with a... I'm sure you're glad sorry, Congress the, doesn't sorry, operate that way. I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has back. expired. The gentleman yields. At this time, the chair will recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Kelly. 
Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the chair and ranking member for hosting this committee, and thank you to Chair Hohen Sark for being here today and the CPSC commissioners. I'm a mother and a grandmother, so I know how quickly children can get a hold of small items like button batteries. Making simple changes and safety standards for products with these small batteries will save children's lives. That's why I was so pleased last Congress when my legislation, Reese's Law, was signed into law. The bill required the CPSC to issue safety standards for button and coin cell batteries. Reese's Law is now almost fully implemented with the labeling requirements being enforced starting in September of this year. Mr. Chair, can you provide an update on the enforcement of Reese's Law? Are companies complying and have any issues arisen? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kelly. As you said, Reese's Law was such an important piece of legislation that was passed focused on button cell batteries. When children swallow button cell batteries, it can eat through their esophagus, causing lifelong injuries and even death. So you know, the 5,000 trips to emergency room we see each year, Reese's Law is designed to, to stop that. Um, as you were alluding to, portions of the Reese's Law has gone into effect already. Some have went to op effect by operation of, uh, of law with respect to packaging and then with respect to the uh, compartments that are in there. We are actively uh, enforcing. We are looking at the marketplace, making sure that that people are complying with the law right, right now. Um, so we are uh, in that process. And then the last part you're talking about uh, with respect to labeling will go into effect later on uh, this year. And then we have just started a new rulemaking to take a look at toys and applying the, what we have learned from Reese's Law to, to toys because Reese's Law really focused in on things like remote controls and making sure the batteries don't fall out of those general products. And how will the 6% uh, cuts for the agency's budget impact the enforcement of this bipartisan law or really the other things that you're trying to do? Uh, it will just slow everything down. It will make it more likely that violative products get into consumers' homes without people, without a cop on the beat. Things just go forward, especially when you start talking about, you know, e-commerce and overseas manufacturers who may not be worried about U.S. laws because they're not based here. So they'll be selling through directly to consumers uh, through these platforms, and we won't be there to stop them, and, and the platforms themselves won't be responsible. Thank you. Now, shifting gears a little bit, my home is, my district is home to the Port of Chicago, generating nearly half a billion dollars in economic ac activity for the region. The CPSC plays a critical role in port surveillance and ensuring that imported consumer products are safe. Over the last few years, we've seen a rise in direct-to-consumer shipments from overseas, presenting challenges to the surveillance of imports. What challenges do low-value direct-to-consumer goods cause for CPSC and port surveillance? So products that are uh, shipments under $800, so-called de minimis imports, we've seen a tremendous growth in those. Last year, about a billion uh, coming into the country, rising from half a billion in 2019. Um, these are going directly to consumers. It's incredibly hard to track. CPSC is working on an e-filing program to be able to require uh, importers to be able to provide more data to uh, the agency to be able to track and uh, identify even the de minimis products, but honestly, given the number of them, without the support at the, the ports, as you said, and without ways to be able to put some of the onus on the platforms that we're doing that, that these are being bought through, um, it is a huge problem. I'm gonna thank you for your uh, response. Um, I know you don't wanna see any funding cuts because that'll definitely affect the agency, but other than more funding, which you've made clear is needed, what can Congress do to ensure you have the tools to enforce safety standards on import products? So I think what you see now for most import products, you're seeing a lot of the e-commerce going through the um, platforms that are being sold through. So I think it's a combination. We've talked about increasing their civil penalties, uh, but it's also making sure that those uh, platforms are taking responsibility for the, the products that are being offered on their sites. Um, I think there should be burdens upon them to be able to make sure the products that they're selling are meeting mandatory standards and are safe for consumers. That is something that Congress could uh, step in and do. 
also making sure that no matter where consumers are going, they have uniform safety protections across the board. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. At this time, I recognize the distinguished Hoosier from Indiana, <laughs> Representative Bouchon. When she said distinguished, you all look that way. You didn't look at me. <laughs> I, don't know, I, said, I, said, no, no, no. I don't know if you're trying to tell me something or what. No, no, no. Thank you to Chair Bill Arrakis, who's sitting next to me, for calling today's hearing. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is clearly tasked with helping every Hoosier be safe, uh, ranging from flammable furniture to durability of helmets. Very much appreciated. Much has changed since 2019, and e-commerce, of course, has picked up, and I don't want to follow along that line of questioning, and I'll ask the chair, uh, what, what does the CPSC do, maybe this has been asked, but in cases where a third-party seller disappears from the marketplace once product recall has been issued? So if we find a defective product and it's a third-party seller that's overseas, We'll reach out, we'll try and do a recall, but oftentimes they'll just disappear. Yeah. At which point in time, we'll go and we'll put a warning out and we'll ask a platform to take down the, the listing. Um, but unfortunately, we, there was a case of a bounce house with a, a tube that strangled a child. We asked that that listing get pulled down. Another week later, that same listing was up under a different manufacturer's name. We play a game of whack-a-mole in those yeah. cases. Not much you can do, I guess, when it's overseas. It's a struggle, I understand, but continue doing, doing that work. Because, you know, um, the vast majority of Amer Americans, including myself, order things online almost on a daily basis. And that's really important. Um, I've also long been an advocate of increasing safety on various all-terrain vehicles. After one of my constituents died in an accident years ago, she happened to be a grade school child. Now Congresswoman Erin Houchin and, and I, when, when she was a state senator, uh, after that tragic situation, uh, were able to, in, at least in Indiana, put a helmet law in place for children on ATVs. Uh, a helmet on this uh, person would have saved, probably saved her life for children. We put that in for children who uh, are under, I think it was under the age 16 and under. But I also realize these vehicles are, not, are, are used not only recreationally, but by police, fire, EMS, Forest Service, many other government services. And I understand the ATV industry has put in place revised safety standards to address hazards involving degree penetration and that CPSC staff participated in the development process. But that the CPSC has a proposed rulemaking on the same subject that was, it seems, unworkable for the industry. Um, again, uh, Chair, if this rule is finalized, will CPSC commit today to working with ATV manufacturers to ensure that they have sufficient time to produce and distribute compliant vehicles? Uh, yes, so to the extent we're finalized, we'll take in all stakeholder input and figure out the time frame that's appropriate. Staff will send that out and the commission yeah. will review that. Yeah, because again, uh, you know, it's not only used recreationally, but it will affect police, fire, and other people. And uh, again, I've been a long-term advocate for safety in this space. Um, this was just one of my constituents that was killed. And over the years, uh, there's been others. Um, and look, people make choices, uh, but um, at least they need to make informed choices. And that's kind of probably where you all come in. With that, I don't have any other questions. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The distinguished lady from the Empire State, Ms. Clark, is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I thank our ranking member, Chikowski, for holding this very important hearing today. I also want to thank all of our commissioners for being here to testify. And let me also thank our commissioners, led by Chair Hohen Sarek, for important work, the important work that you all do to protect the American consumer's safety from defective and dangerous products. A modern, increasingly complex economy like ours can be a marvel of productivity, producing new technological advances and products that make the lives of everyday citizens easier and that, innovate spirit, that innovative spirit must be protected. At the same time, we must embrace the realities of the 21st century environment we live in. And the current budget proposed for CPSC certainly does not recognize that reality. As the proposed 6% cut 
would be disastrous for the commission and consumers alike. Unfortunately, our increasingly digital lives can create openings for bad actors to operate with impunity, and the CPSC stands as our vanguard against that kind of behavior. A significant cut of this nature would necessitate significant staffing cuts to the CPSC at a time when e-commerce is flourishing, is growing exponentially, making it easier than ever for bad and negligent actors to flood our markets with defective products in pursuit of a quick buck. And this can have major consequences for millions of people. For example, in New York City, e-mobility solutions like e-bikes and scooters fuel a robust food delivery industry and are becoming increasingly popular alternatives to automo automobile traffic, something that should be viewed as a positive development in our efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Unfortunately, due to a flood of faulty lithium ion batteries, New York City has seen a significant uptick in fire as a result of these batteries. I was proud to partner with Congressman Richie Torres and a bipartisan group of New York members on H.R. 1797, the Setting Consumer Standards for Lithium Ion Batteries Act, which would address these faulty batteries and codify common sense standards. And while that legislation has moved through this committee and passed the House, it is unfortunately stalled in the Senate as of now. Chair Hohen Sarek, can you speak to how H.R. 1797 would help to combat this spate of fires in New York and other jurisdictions across the country. And could you also speak more broadly to the challenges posed by the rising utilization of e-commerce -plat e platforms and how the proposed budget cuts might exacerbate those challenges? Um, and other commissioners are invited to chime in as well. Thank you for the question. The legislation that you put forward is extremely important. It would cut through the lengthy process that we often have to go through when we are regulating under our organic statute. Um, as you pointed out, we have uh, seen nearly 300 fires in the last three years associated with lithium ion batteries. And while it hasn't had a dramatic impact on New York, it's hit 40, other, 40 states. So it is not just a New York problem, it is one we're seeing across the country as well. And it, your legislation would be able to speed the process to getting safe laws because as you said, a lot of the batteries that we're seeing are cheaply made knockoffs from overseas coming in from countries like China. And when those are put with a bike that is a good bike, um, it can result in fires. Generally speaking, as you said, the, the asking about the cuts, the cuts will dramatically impact us and be and as we're looking at the e-commerce side of things making sure that we're able to stop those imports coming into the country it will become so much harder with fewer people at the ports fewer compliance officers fewer ways to be able to stop the import of those uh, bad products just in closing because uh, i don't have much time left i would love to get the rest of your comments say that we we have to take a a real forward look at where we are in our civil society with respect to the way we consume goods and products. And there's no doubt in my mind, just looking at certain platforms of e-commerce, we don't even know who these companies are. We're just buying these items, only to find out once we receive them that they can harm us, our families, our children. And I think that this committee has a responsibility to catch up with the times. This is the 21st century. We're not going back to the way things used to be. We have to look at how things are and how they'll be in the future. And you're on the front lines of that. So let me thank each and every one of you for working under such uh, challenging circumstances. The staffing you need needs to be put in place now so that our children and grandchildren are, are protected and they inherit from us a more robust uh, board. Uh, and you're doing the, the good work. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the general lady, and I also want to thank the general lady from Florida for filling in for me. But I didn't want her to get too comfortable. All right, uh, folks. Uh, next, we have uh, the general lady from uh, from Arizona, Miss Lasko, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner Trumpka. 
Uh, you tweeted from your official account as a CPSC commissioner several statements putting the safety of gas stoves into question. Uh, do you believe it's appropriate for a commissioner to do this before the commission has made a safety determination? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative. Um, I do believe it is incumbent to share safety concerns as an individual commissioner when we see them. So even before the commission made the determination, you thought it was perfectly fine? Well, I think there's a, there's a few different things. I mean, if you're talking about rulemaking, that is a process that we go through as a commission, but sharing our concerns about individual potential product hazards is something that, that commissioners do. Um, Commissioner Trumka, you also tweeted your support for legislation to ban fossil fuels and phase gas stoves out of homes. Do you think that's appropriate for a commissioner? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I don't remember doing that. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Chair Cohen Sarek a question. Um, Mr. Chair, on March 1st, 2023, the Consumer Protection Safety Commission approved a request for information related to gas stoves, which was characterized as, I quote, gas stove hazards and potential solutions. Does the CPSC have any plans to re-regulate or regulate gas stoves or other gas-fired appliances? So there's no uh, plans for any regulatory rulings. Obviously, there's a law that's passed. We do actively look at individual products and have conducted at least four recalls of gas stoves where it was uh, carbon monoxide leaks. Um, so we uh, continue that work, but not with respect to um, Regulating, we do examine it. We've been working with voluntary standards committees. I think industry has recognized the importance of both trying to measure the, the fumes coming off of stoves and honestly all cooking, and then how to deal with those and whether ventilation is appropriate. So can, the agency continues to work in the voluntary process and to gather more information about the potential has health issues associated with um, gas stoves as we do for all consumer products. So you currently don't plan to ban gas stoves, is that no, correct? Uh, no, Congresswoman, there's no plan to, to ban gas stoves. All right, um, Mr. Chair, when the Consumer Protection Safety Commission issues RFIs on a product, do they usually infer that there is an existing hazard requiring a solution, or is the RFI process intended to gather information to inform the commission as to whether their uh, hazard even exists? So usually if we're going to do an RFI, there's some indication that there's a reason that this is an area that the commission should be looking at. So you know, in the case of gas stoves, we've been talking to the, the industry about fumes coming off of those stoves. So obviously that was an area that the commission's focused on. Other RFIs have focused on things like um, uh, specific issues with bikes and others. So it's, we tend to look not just throw something out broadly, but to see if there's a problem and then gather information to see whether that there are any next steps or information that can be used either by industry or by us to be able to improve the safety of products. Regarding this request for information related to gas stoves, uh, what has the CPSC done with the information gathered during that process? So we received over 9,000 comments from a variety of stakeholders, from academics to industry. Um, those are all public and available for people to take a look at and to examine and use in the voluntary standards process as others. Staff is still in the process of re reviewing them at this point in time. So besides reviewing it, does the CPSC have plans to do anything further with information gathered via the RFI? Uh, any next steps generally would be done through a vote of all the commissioners. Um, at this point in time, there's nothing in our operating plan to move forward in a, re in a regulatory as in rulemaking process. Again, when we deal with individual hazards coming out of you know stoves or any products, we do take uh, action and we do try and get products recalled if they are defective or dangerous. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Now I'll recognize Ms. Trahan for f her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chair Bill Rockus and Ranking Member Schakowsky. 
uh, for convening today's uh, hearing, and thank you to Chair Hohen Sarek uh, and the other four commissioners for being here today. I deeply appreciate the CPSC's hard work to keep dangerous and deadly consumer products off the market, especially everything that you have done to protect our children and our young people. I strongly oppose the devastating cuts proposed by the Republican appropriators that would cut, gut the agency's staff and their ability to protect consumers. Too many parents and families live through the nightmare of having their child seriously injured or even worse, killed by a dangerous uh, consumer product. And I'm sure that throughout your work as commissioners, you've encountered deadly products that never should have been brought to the consumer market in the first place. But possibly the most egregious example is a product that serves no consumer purpose other than to intentionally take one's own life. That's the case for high purity uh, sodium nitrate, which is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans, with that number tragically climbing. In low concentrations, sodium nitrite is safely used to cure meat and fish, but at high concentrations, there is no use for this chemical other than to end one's life, which has been promoted and popular, popularized on online suicide forums by anonymous users, uh, sickeningly guiding vulnerable in, um, individuals to die by suicide. As a parent, it's terrifying to think that this poison can be ordered by a child online and inconspicuously arrive on their doorstep, often without our knowledge. Now, this committee took strong unanimous action to ban high concentration sodium nitrite by passing the Youth Poisoning Protection Act, which would direct the CPSC to ban high concentration sodium nitrite. And I'm looking forward to passing that legislation through the Senate and getting it signed into law. Chair Hohen Sarek, how does the CPSC enforce restrictions on dangerous substances such as sodium nitrite, particularly dangerous substances that may be ordered online and shipped directly to consumers? So we do have an e-safe team that goes and monitors marketplaces looking for products that are violative or that have, have been uh, banned or recalled. Uh, in a case like this, if we saw anything on there, first of all, we would do uh, business education to make sure that people knew about the, the ban that's, that was in place. Second, we'd be monitoring the marketplaces. Whenever we'd saw it, see it, we'd reach out to both the platform to make sure that was taken down, but also, which is voluntary on their part, uh, and also to go to the manufacturers to make sure that that is stopped. If they are overseas, that is a lot harder. If they're in the U.S., then, of course, we'd uh, educate them on the, the statute and make sure that that was not for sale. Exactly the watchdogs that we need. I thank you for that. I think it's important to remember that high purity sodium nitrite is safely purchased uh, in bulk by the meat and fish industries to dilute and use as a preservative and by research and education institutions as a chemical reagent. Of course, the Youth Poisoning Protection Act does not impact them. Um, but just so we're clear, Mr. Chairman, how would the CPSC ensure that restrictions on sales to consumers do not affect businesses and research institutions that have legitimate reason to buy high concentration sodium nitrate? Our purview is consumer products. To, to the extent that they're business to business and our actions, anything that's done on a commercial basis, that would be really uh, beyond us. We, we will focus really on whether or not a product is being sold to consumers and you know, stop, the, uh, stop that, those sales. Thank you. Finally, um, does the CPSC need additional resources to enforce the Youth Poisoning Protection Act when it's signed into law? And how would these proposed budget cuts affect that enforcement? You know, that it's been estimated, like our staff looking at it, that it may cost about $2 million over five years to fully implement. Um, obviously, any cuts to our budget are going to impact our ability to both um, educate businesses about the, the ban and also to be able to enforce and to go online and monitor the marketplaces to make sure that, as you said, the, the teenagers, kids out there aren't buying this. It's just, it's, it's okay. tragic. Thank you. Seems like a small price to pay to protect our children. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, General Lady. Yields back. Now I'll recognize the chairman of the, the vice chairman of the full committee, Mr. Armstrong, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you. How do you all define numerous? Uh, 
Chair? I would say uh, similar to many. I, it would depend on the context. Um, okay. If you, okay. You help. So in Vegas, in a video car, in a video poker machine, a royal flush pays 250 to one. To give that perspective, four of a kind pays 25 to one. And those are Vegas odds, not real odds. The actual odds of drawing a straight flush are 0.000154%. The reason I bring that up is because that is the higher percentage than dying from an ROV or a UTV based on a penetration value. Over the course of a 20 year study, and this is on lifespan, I'm assuming there's more, it's 0.00014%. There were six deaths, four from branches, one from a large stick, and one from a three inch piece of wood. There are also 20 injuries, which is a 0.0005% chance of injury. But the injuries are 10 hospital admissions, three emergency room treatments, three first aid, and 10 level of care not known. So I'm reading your notice of proposed rule that was issued in 2021, and it said numerous injuries. And so I'm asking how you define numerous because I would define that as extremely rare. What happened to that case at the DC circuit, Mr. Feldman? Are you referring to the WCMA case? Yeah. The WCMA, the WCMA case vacated the agency's rulemaking. Why did they vacate it? Uh, for two main reasons. One, the court took issue with uh, the, the uh, unreasonable length of time that we put for uh, uh, rule implementation. It also took issue with the agency's failure to share incident data with stakeholders and provide an opportunity for notice and comment. Yeah. Cost benefit analysis, yes, flawed sir. notice. Uh, comments on underlying incident data and arbitrary effective date. That's what I have, right? Yes, sir. And how do they deal with the industry's uh, revised adequately addressed CPC's concerns on, on voluntary industry compliance? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Was there substantial compliance by the industry to solve this, what I'll say is extremely rare, but your notice said, Numerous. <laughs> With respect to the the yeah. uh, the ROV rulemaking, yeah. uh, is there we're, we're we're still in the process of reviewing the comments that we put out. Uh, we we in, in in accordance with the WCMA case, uh, need to publish the incident data for public comment. I, I anticipate that that will occur later this summer. So was there so when the rule went into place? Can you explain to me how you get there? from that few number of incidents into a place where you are mandatory complying in industry, not taking into effect supply chain, not figure, figuring cost of compliance, no retailer. I mean, things that kill more people than ATVs over that period of time, fireworks, which makes sense, skydiving, which makes sense, vending machines, balloons. I mean, you're putting an entire industry in, in a place of forced compliance and if the DC circuit wouldn't have vacated, that would have happened, right? Uh, sir, the OHV debris penetration rule is not currently in effect. Okay. So what did the DC circuit court vacate? The WCMA window covering. The window covering rule. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving forward, as you're going through this rule, like how do you factor in uh, the number of incidents that occur in debris? Do you factor in where they're driving it, how they're driving it, how many miles are driven, where these vehicles are driven? Yes, sir. All those factors uh, are, are go into the agency's uh, uh, calculus about not only the risk assessment, uh, but also hearing directly from, uh, from, from industry about the, uh, the, the, the extent of uh, uh, the, the injuries reviewing the incidents that we're aware of. Uh, with an opportunity to comment, uh, and, and, and beyond that, an, an, an opportunity to weigh in about any technical feasibility or cost issues related to the, uh, the, the standard that the agency might propose. Thank We're in you. the process of doing that right now. Yeah, perfect, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, now I'll recognize uh, Mr. Falter from the great state of Idaho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna stay on the same topic as, as uh, uh, my good friend here next to me uh, on the ROV debris penetration issue, if I may. And so this would be for the chair. The industry put in place revised safety standards to address this debris penetration hazard in March of 23, which, at least according to the industry, reflects the best engineering judgment and industry safety experts within. 
does the CPSC still intend on pressing ahead with this, with this proposed mandatory rulemaking on the debris penetration? So the notice of proposed rulemaking that was put forward to us on staff's analysis, there were six deaths associated with it, and they looked at the voluntary standard as we're required to do, and that was designed to stop the penetration at speed of 2.5 miles per hour. So, so is this, is it, is it still, you're still pursuing this? It is still before the commission. I think the next steps, as Commissioner Feldman said, is we'd have to put out the data for, for review and before we move forward. So um, I would just point out that CPSC staff, from what I understand, participated in the revision process for the industry standards, had every opportunity to provide substantive input. That appears to me to be the time to work through some of these things. Um, not, not after with this proposed rulemaking. So just, I guess, take that for whatever it's worth. Um, Mr. Trumka, uh, trade associations representing all-train vehicle industry have made multiple requests to meet with you, at least that's what I'm told. But you have refused to have discussions with them. Is, is that true, and if so, why? Um, Appreciate the opportunity. Can I quickly address the debris penetration and then uh, answer As soon that? as you answer my question. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, I have received written information from folks. I'm not sure if I've received meeting requests, but I'm happy to go back and examine okay. those. If I have, I'm happy to take those meetings. Okay, All right, thank you. And, and you wanted and, to address and the, the debris penetration, the one point I'd like to make is that it's a particularly vexing issue. I, I own a quad, I own a side-by-side, -side, and as Mr. Bouchon pointed out earlier, you know, we want to put out PSAs on people wearing helmets, wearing their seat belts, keeping your arms inside the vehicles to stay safe. Those things don't protect against the debris penetration issue. We've seen those impalements happening at less than five miles an hour. So you could be creeping through the woods and being safe, and it's not going to prevent that. that that's why I think it's a particularly vexing if, if, issue. If uh, Mr. Armstrong's statistics are correct, it does appear to be pretty rare at least with, uh, with any degree of, of injury. And so uh, this rulemaking has the potential of shutting down an industry, basically. And, and so, it, you know, it, it does appear pretty extreme from the vantage point that we're in. But I'm gonna move on here. Uh, I want a, a question for Mr. Feldman. Um, and we talked about the DC Circuit uh, recently vacating the mandatory rule disregarding the window covering issue. Um, since Mr. Armstrong covered this, I would just follow up by saying, should CPSC press ahead with its proposed mandatory rules, or will the commission follow the teachings of a window covering case to meet the representatives of the ATV and RV industries? Yeah, on the OHV debris penetration, uh, in, in June 22, we, we approved a, a, an NPR. I supported that because I wanted to receive comments from industry specifically on the issues that you're raising. I've, uh, I've heard the concerns about the mandatory standard, uh, in, including the ones that you're raising today. Uh, going forward, we need to publish the incident data, uh, and that's consistent with the, the, the ruling and the requirements that the DC Circuit made clear uh, in the WCMA case. I'm also aware that congressional appropriators are considering language regarding the rulemaking uh, and prohibiting us to, from, from moving forward with it. Should Congress advance that permit, uh, uh, provision, the, the commission would take that direction and follow the law. All right. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Appreciate it. Now I'll recognize, uh, we don't have a Democrat on this side, so I'll recognize uh, Ms. Uh, Cardenas. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Ms. Ms. Harshberger, uh, for her five minutes of questioning. A great lady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. And I'll just continue following up on that line of questioning. Uh, I'll follow up on the ROV voluntary standard for debris penetration. You know, I'm from East Tennessee. We use those ATVs, UTVs, side by sides, the whole nine yards uh, on a daily basis. And I understand that the new product safety standards based on real world field data, including hundreds of thousands of hours of actual ROV usage. And the voluntary rule reflects input from a broad array of stakeholders, including industry, rider, consumer safety uh, voices. So I guess my question to you, and I will start with you, Mr. Chair, uh, it looks like you intend 
to press forward with this mandatory rule. Am I correct? Uh, it's before that's the process going forward. Okay. If so, uh, will it follow a fact-based approach that includes the input of the regulated community from all these standards? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think what we found is that the voluntary standard is designed to uh, protect people at two and a half miles per hour. The, the one that staff put forward was at 10 miles per hour. So it's a question of what's a realistic ex expectation for consumers and whether it's an unreasonable risk of injury to have a penetration at three miles per hour when you're riding around in a uh, you know, side by side or a other, other device. Okay. On January 12th, 2023, former CPSC Chair Ann Brown published an opinion piece in the Washington Post titled Guns or Consumer Products. They should be regulated as such. This is despite the letter of the law, specifically the Consumer Product Safety Commission Improvement Act of 1976 expressly prohibiting the CPSC from making any rule or order restricting the manufacture or sale of firearms or ammunition. And this question is to each of you, yes or no, is the CPSC legally permitted to implement gun control measures? That's a yes or no, and I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Trumpka. And go down the line. No, they are exempt from our act. No. 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 Okay. The Green New Deal agenda of the Biden administration has reduced the baseload power that energy providers formerly operated with due to the retirement of coal-fired uh, coal power plants. This reduction in baseload power has resulted in rolling blackouts uh, during energy intensive storms, including Winter Storm Elliott, uh, which took out power for many of my constituents and businesses for, that desperately needed uh, to heat their homes, keep their businesses running, it cost millions and millions of dollars. When Americans lose power, they need generators to turn their lights on and heat their homes. But the CPSC is seeking to upend the production of generators by developing new carbon monoxide standards, which we talked about earlier, that cannot be easily met. So my question is, does the CPSC consider the impact on Americans who have lost power due to the policies of this administration when developing standards on generators? And anybody can answer that question or everybody can answer that question. I think we can look at this from a very much from a safety perspective. Oftentimes after storms, people lose power. And fortunately, that's where we also see a lot of the deaths that are out there because carbon monoxide mm -hmm. builds up in their homes. So our proposal is to look at how to make them safe not to, uh, and to make sure that families don't die as a result of trying I to understand. recover from a storm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anybody else want to answer? I agree that we want these to be available for folks who need them and safe when they use them. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all I have, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. Okay. I'll recognize the, the great lady from the state of Florida, Ms. Kamick, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Boyle, I'm going to start with you. Um, I wanted to learn more about your time as a executive director. You served at least two acting chairs in that capacity, correct? Yes. Okay. And before that, you served in two other senior roles. Is that right? Uh, I served as general counsel and executive director. Okay. I think we can both agree those are senior roles. Excuse me? I think we can both agree yes. those are senior roles. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so it seems that a lot of the issues and dysfunction that we've heard about today um, have occurred under your leadership as executive director. And while I recognize that you were not acting chair, it makes me wonder how all of this kind of happened under your watch. So digging into it as part of a review of the 2019 data breach, the inspector general made the following finding, quote, the OIG found numerous examples of problems regarding integrity and ethical values in the clearinghouse. These problems involve both systematic issues and examples of individual managers failing to uphold government standards regarding integrity or ethical values. The most egregious example of a systematic ongoing failure by agency management to demonstrate a commitment to integrity and ethical values involved the statements of assurance relevant to the clearinghouse. Agency officials were grossly negligent at best and lied at worst when they signed statements of assurance indicating that internal controls regarding the clearinghouse were in place and operating effectively. So Commissioner Boyle, how do you account for the IG's characterization of agency candor? 
You were the executive director at that time. So what the heck was going on? Well, thank you for the question. I think at the time of the clearinghouse disclosure, the agency was forthright in, in, in saying that there was a, a mistake that was made, a human error. Or multiple? Certainly, certainly. I, I think there was no question, and uh, the agency was forthright in admitting that. There were numerous investigations, including by uh, houses of Congress, and we, I think, were very forthright in admitting that there were mistakes, and we made efforts to correct those mistakes. And when there was a human error, which is really the source of the problem that you're talking about, uh, we uh, acted to correct those as best we could, and I certainly did the best I could in, under my uh, uh, to the best of my ability. So we instituted training, we tried to develop some uh, technological solutions, and you know, I understand that uh, you know, there was great concern, and I think we were very um, forthright in admitting that. And I appreciate you know, taking accountability, right? But accountability means action. You said that there was technical training, but if you have people who are outright lying, I mean, my question is, who was fired? I, I, I'm not aware that anybody was fired at that time, and there had been open uh, recommendations for some period well after I was executive director, so I won't account for the last several years. But at that time, uh, there was nobody was fired, but there was certainly uh, training, and, uh, issue, and there was a, an attempt to address uh, very openly uh, the problems that we found, and, and nobody tried to say otherwise. So no one was fired. Did anyone resign? No. Have the people who have been identified who lied, right, in this particular investigation, the people identified, have they remained in those positions or have they gone on to other positions? Well, let me be clear. I understand you quoted from the Inspector General's report. I am not aware of anyone lying. I don't think, I am not aware of anyone lying to me. And so I understand that that was uh, his conclusion and how he characterized it, but I am not aware of anyone lying to me. But, I mean, you understand that this is the frustration that American people have in general. You're here before this committee asking for a bump in your budget, um, and yet we're finding through OIG reports where there have been instances of mis mischaracterizations, lying, um, real issues that have truly not been addressed. And I think saying, yes, we're taking responsibility, but what is the action that follows thereafter? I don't think training is enough. I mean, there has to be real accountability. So. I'm curious, and as a follow-up, I'd like you to provide this committee with what has happened to those individuals that received the training, and I want to know if they've moved on into other uh, positions. There is a, a saying in Washington, it's called failing up, and we tend to see that when we have problematic people, we tend to move them into other positions. So I'd be curious to see where those individuals and the roles that they played in, that were identified in that OIG report, I wanna know where they are now. Can you provide this committee with that information? Certainly, again, I will make clear that they're not under my purview in my current role, and I will have to consult with the chair in terms of- Mr. Chairman, will you provide that information to this committee? Uh, we'll go back and take a look. Obviously, I wasn't there at the time, so I have to go back and look at the... the uh, at some point, report. if you're at the top of the ticket, you're right there. You're the head honcho. Buck stops with you, right? Understood, and I would so say... So you should be able to get that information. any breach of similar nature uh, since that happened, and we've made sure that those that information is protected going forward. So we can look to try and provide you information. We don't try. We do. So, yes, you will provide that information? Uh, we'll provide the uh, information we can find, and that's appropriate, yes. All right. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Our general lady yields back. We'll recognize Mr. Cardenas from the great state of California for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Bilirakis, and also Ranking Member Schakowsky for holding this hearing today, and I appreciate the opportunity to wave on to the committee. Um, I also want to thank the commissioners for being here today, and I'm looking forward to discussing the work you've done and uh, continue to do on behalf of uh, our 340 million plus American constituents. Last Congress, we passed my bill, the Safe Sleep for Babies Act, which makes it unlawful for manufacturers to sell or distribute crib bumpers or inclined sleepers for infants. The law bans both crib bumpers, a category of products responsible for at least 107 infant deaths between 1990 and 2016 alone, and inclined infant sleepers like the recalled Fisher-Price Rock and Play, which was linked to over 100 infant deaths. Manufacturers of some infant products have known from the start that their products were risky and violated safe sleep advice. 
and I commend the CPSC and staff for working quickly to address these dangers through the enforcement of the Infant Sleep Products Act uh, rule. The passage of the Safe Sleep for Babies Act helped move the needle in creating a safe landscape for infant product safety, but th therefore it's always more, there's always more work to do. Chair Honsarak, Sarik, uh, what have been the successes and challenges the commission has encountered as it has worked to implement the Safe Sleep for Babies Act? Uh, thank you, Mr. Cardenas. As you said, Safe Sleep for Babies Act is a tremendously important piece of legislation that addressed you know, hazards associated with infant sleep and both inclined sleepers as well as uh, crib bumpers. We've been active in the enforcement side of things and making sure that uh, those types of products are off the market. That is some of the challenges that we've been seeing. Uh, in recent months, we were uh, doing investigations and took down uh, the, around 2,000 crib bumpers that were still being sold. So it's making sure that, that people are getting smart as well. They're calling them something slightly different, but look at the mm -hmm. pictures and you know exactly what they're for. So it's going on, especially on the online world, to make sure that we're able to uh, stop those things from, from happening. Thank you. And uh, Chair, uh, Chairman, what effect would the Republican majority's proposed 6% budget cut uh, have on your ability to protect families and consumers from harmful sleep products uh, for infants? Yeah, I think it would impact both what's our imports and ability to stop things in imports, but also we have an e-commerce team that last year reviewed about 3 million products online um, and did a takedown request of uh, nearly 60,000. All those uh, you know, jobs are at risk to be able to make sure that we have people there to do that, to be able to monitor, um, especially since uh, you know, the, the manufacturers often are overseas and selling directly to our consumers. So a 6% budget cut would actually make it harder for you to protect infants uh, like you've been trying to do so far? Absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with you to give families peace of mind in knowing that when their infant goes to sleep, the only thing parents must worry about is their baby waking up before uh, they do, uh, before they start their day. Um, also, Chairman, you mentioned in your testimony that outreach is a challenge not only with infant sleep products, but other products as well. Distributing good information on product safety to non-English speaking communities uh, can often be uniquely difficult as well. So Chairman, what hurdles have you encountered in efforts to increase public safety outreach, particularly outreach in languages other than English? Uh, one of the things the agency has been able to do with the ARPA funds that have been provided is to translate our recalls into Spanish. Um, Commissioner Boyle has been a huge proponent of that. Uh, and as that money goes away and our budget shrinks, you have that as um, being put at, put at risk. In addition, we've done a lot of um, community building to be able to find voices who are trusted, because oftentimes, um, unfortunately, um, we, we might need to be a trusted voice. We're not well known, and sometimes the government is not always um, uh, trusted, and so we wanna build those relationships and find those voices out there. That also takes time, that takes resources to be able to build that awareness. Once again, cuts will just make it harder. Um, uh, last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a letter to your commission expressing concern over many baby products that put children's lives in danger. Uh, can you update us on what the CPSC is doing as it relates to weighted infant sleep products? And are, are there other products that Congress should be looking at to make it safer for children to, to survive while sleeping? So we uh, don't do pre-market approval. So unfortunately, we often follow to see whether there are deaths and injuries associated with products. Um, the, the pediatrician has raised concerns about weighted products. So did CDC and um, so did NIH. We have, based off of their um, uh, information, given updates to consumers about um, uh, guidance on weighted sleep sacks. Um, and we are engaged in the voluntary standards side as well to be able to see if there's ways to improve the safety oh, of these products. But obviously they're out there and they're still being used. Thank you so much. My time having expired, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This concludes the questioning for today. I appreciate everyone. Thank you to the panel uh, for your, uh, your answers and of course your testimony as well. 
Uh, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the, the documents included on the staff hearing documents list without objection. No so ordered. Yep. Uh, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to those questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by close of business day on August uh, 6th. So we appreciate y'all. I thought it was a great uh, discussion, a uh, good hearing, and uh, without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.